So, uh, welcome back to um, uh, the uh, seminar. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Uh, as you recall, yesterday we started the first session of the seminar by talking about um, why we should know about the religions of the world and why there are so many religions in the world from a Vaishnava perspective and how do we understand the authenticity, um, evaluate the authenticity of different traditions. What's the standard? What's the measure? Uh, and then in the next session, I gave you a whirlwind tour of three of the major religious traditions, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. And um, today, I want to uh, raise two questions. Uh, the first question is um, how now that we know something about them, and we know why it's important to know about them, and how we uh, understand them, the question is on practical terms, how do we relate to persons of other religious traditions? And um, for that we look towards the example of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, as it's described in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, and then the um, final question we're going to ask is, after going through all of this, why should we be devotees of Krishna still? Uh, we have all these different options available. Uh, uh, like we said the first day on the marketplace of religion, why should we still choose this particular product? And there's very good reasons that we can be very, very proud of and very confident about. And uh, hopefully we'll talk about some of those unique reasons uh, today. Did you want to die? <laughs> Om Gyan Timiran Vistya Gyanan Trashnaka Chakshurum Vritam Jay Tasmai Shri Guru Vedamaha Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Vishaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauru Vaya Vishayane Nirvishesha Shri Mati Vashya So, um, in Adi Lila Chaitanya Chaitanya there's a really nice story of how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu met with um, the Muslim magistrate of Navadri. His name was Jam Kazi. Uh, the position of Kazi is one of uh, a magistrate, someone who is responsible not for levying taxes, but for enforcing laws uh, and keeping order and making judgments. So it's kind of like a judge, magistrate, slash police executive, that kind of thing. Uh, and the Kazi would report to them the governor of Bengal, uh, basically, um, who would then be under the Nawab. Uh, so, a relatively important post and someone who would look after all of Nawabi. And uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Sankirtan movement was just growing uh, in Nawabi. Uh, it was exploding in uh, so many uh, ways uh, after he returned from Gaya. So, uh, up until he went to Gaya um, on pilgrimage, up to that time he was a very, um, it says he was a very good boy. He would do his studies and he was very responsible and he was married and, you know, like very a civilized and responsible person in society, contributing member of society. And then he came back from Gaya and he underwent this amazing transformation. No one could figure out what had come over him. He became mad in uh, by chanting Krishna's holy names. And this was a yeah, very um, shocking transformation. But it has a very contagious effect in that it caused uh, everyone uh, else who came in contact with him to start chanting Krishna's holy name also. And this gradually spread in Navadvip to the point where Sankirtan, Nagar Sankirtan, was the main form of religious practice for the people of Navadvi. Every evening they do loud sankirtan in their homes and out on the streets and everything. And they would uh, get um, uh, more and more <coughs> the local Muslims were getting upset and irritated by this because it was so loud and it was so obvious and they complained. Uh, but not only the Muslims were complaining, you know who else was complaining? The Brahmanas. The, Hindus, the Brahmanas. Uh, they came to the Kazi and also said, you know, he is completely making a, a fool out of us. Uh, we are so embarrassed seeing these Hare Krishnas chanting and dancing and on the streets. 
uh, and we're trying to do our pujas properly and stay pure and everything. It says in the Vedas that Vedic mantras should not be recited publicly. Uh, and of all the Vedic mantras, Krishna's, God's name is the greatest of all mantras. This they got right. Uh, and therefore, it should not be recited in public because it will lose its power, its potency. Uh, if you chant this too loudly and too far and wide, it weakens its power. So they said this should be stopped. So it was there. They were envious also, and the Muslims were envious also. Um, uh, it's, it's actually a very um, uh, important point here because a lot of the times we uh, like to blame people of other religions for uh, problems in our own religion. Uh, there's so much conversion going on and so much. Uh, attacks and so much this and that. But what we don't realize is that according to the scriptures, to the Shastras, the downfall of the Vedic tradition happened internally because of the people within, not outside. The very first downfall of the Vedic tradition happened when? In our, in, uh, in our own period, or you could say, as described in Bhagavatam. Do you know how it began? Anyone but Muslim about you? Hiranyaka <laughs> uh, Shippu, but after that, in recent times, uh, he had the right answer. Shringi. Shringi. Uh, Shringi was the Brahman uh, who was the son of the Shamikrishi, yes. <laughs> so it was your son who caused the downfall that began the yoga. <laughs> so, you have anything to say to that? <laughs> Any apologies to make? <laughs> so you should be proud of that fact. Because the yoga began, therefore the process became really easy. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to this earth, now, otherwise he wouldn't be here. So thank you. <laughs> but anyway, this boy, his name was Shringi, uh, in his first incarnation, and Damodar in his second, uh, he put this uh, snake, no, sorry, uh, Parishan Maharaj put this snake around the neck of Shringi's father. And uh, Parishat, um, or rather Shringi, came and he saw that and he became so upset that he cursed the person who did this to die in seven days without knowing who had done it uh, or what the reason was. It was a genuine, he, okay, it was not proper, but he wasn't trying to be malicious. He was just overcome with thirst and hunger. And so he, um, uh, he, uh, he did this kind of innocently, you know, just becoming overcome with hunger and thirst. Very natural thing. And then Shringi cursed him to die in seven days, a very severe punishment. And uh, uh, Prabhupada says that this was the beginning of the downfall of the Brahmanas. And when the Brahmans fall down, then the rest of society also comes crashing down. Why? Because he misused his power. He thought, I am a Brahman and I have this ability to curse. So without thinking, it's a very powerful thing that Brahmanas hold. And without using it properly, he just threw it out there and said, okay, whoever it is, out of anger only. You know, he didn't control anger, which is supposed to be one of the qualities of a Brahman. And so he, uh, he began the downfall of the Brahman community and from there the beginning of Kali Yuga. Here also in Chaitanya Lila we find that the Brahmanas are those who go back and they criticize Mahaprabhu. Uh, what are you doing? You're cheapening our religion. You're, you're creating a ruckus. So um, sometimes it's easy to, find a, to, to blame the finger to those who are outside. But we have to look inside and say that are we actually living up to the standards <coughs> that our uh, Vedic tradition asks us to live up to. And if the answer is no, then we have no right to blame others until we can fix our own selves. So, um, anyway, so they started criticizing Mahaprabhu and the Qazi thought, well, okay, Muslims, Hindus, both are doing this, so let's, you know, do something about it. And so he showed up with some of his men at one of the Sankirtans that were happening. And uh, there he broke one of the Vedangas. Vedangas made a play. He broke it and he pronounced that no one should do this Sankirtan anymore in Navadvipa. And the devotees panicked. They were very worried. It was like if there was a government decree, you know, like in Russia there was. 
there's no chanting, no kirtan, you can do it publicly in China. So they went to Mahaprabhu and said, well, what do we do? And Mahaprabhu said, just go on kirtan, go on chanting, ignore it. But the devotees were still not able to do it with courage. They were still afraid the whole time. You know, they were trying to follow Mahaprabhu's instructions, but you're scared. You've got a family, you've got kids, and you know, you're openly flouting the, the, the Qazi's uh, rule. Uh, and so finally Mahaprabhu said, okay, this is enough. I am going to lead all of us in Sankirtan. And he said, you should go everywhere in Navadri, from all the nine uh, dvipas, the nine different towns that comprise the area of Navadri. Go there and get everyone to come. Men, women, children, everyone. And give them all these uh, uh, torches for the night, of the burning flames. And we will do Sankirtan in the night. And uh, I will lead everyone in Kirtan. And so he took practically the whole town of Navadvip with him. And huge Sankirtan. Uh, Nityananda Prabhu was there and, and uh, Haridas Thakur, no, um, uh, Srivas Thakur, Srivas Thakur and uh, all Advaita Chai, all were there and in uh, doing powerful Sankirtan. Uh, and as they uh, uh, the, went to the area of the Kazi, the, the Sankirtan party grew and grew as people joined and joined and joined. He says he went through every uh, um, uh, street and every lane in Navadvi and uh, called people to come. And finally, uh, they arrived at the door of the Kazi. And the Kazi heard uh, this great sound outside. And while one person can make a rule if you've got a soldiers and the policemen, but if the whole public comes against you, right, civil disobedience, then what can you do? And so he became very frightened, and he ran up into his inner apartments and refused to come out. Uh, and then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu calmed the whole crowd down. He went inside uh, to the door of the Kazi, and he sat down there uh, and sent some respectable people, it says, some people who had some social standing in society, to go inside and ask the Kazi to come out. And when he was requested, the Kazi uh, came out. The Prabhupada explains uh, in the purport uh, that, anyway, we'll talk about uh, what this teaches us in a minute. The Kazi returned, he came out, uh, and he said, uh, uh, Mahaprabhu started off by saying, look, I, I come to your home as a guest, and you hide, is this the right way to treat a guest? And he said, uh, my lord, uh, brought a whole crowd, an army with you. I, all of these people are upset. What can I do? Uh, and then they, they speak very sweetly. He, Kazi says, look, in our village relationship, I'm your uncle. Uh, um, because I was a friend of uh, your maternal... Um, and so uh, he said, we have a village relationship, a friendly relationship. You should not be angry at me. And Mahaprabhu says, I'm not angry at you. Uh, and he asked him, but you tell me one thing. Why is it that you're killing the cow? Uh, your cow is your mother, she gives you milk. And the bull plows the field, therefore he is your father. Why are you killing your mother and father? What is the religious principle here? And the Kazi replies very intelligently. He says, uh, you see, your scriptures, my lord, are called the Vedas. And you are basing this point on the Vedas. Our scriptures are called, uh, is called the Quran. And in the Quran, it is said that if you kill the animal properly, halal, he's talking about, he talked about yesterday, then you can consume the animal. Isn't it that even in your Vedas, there's animal killing prescribed in the sacrifices? In the so you're very intelligent, Kazi. And Mahaprabhu then responds, he says, yes, but in Kali Yuga, animal sacrifices are forbidden. Because um, in uh, earlier days, the sacrifice was performed, the animal was killed, and when the animal was killed in the fire sacrifice, an old animal would be rejuvenated with a young, new body. And this would be a way to test the strength of the mantras, the, the proper efficacy of the mantra. Because the killing or the rejuvenation of the animal was not the goal of the sacrifice. 
It was to get rain, or it was to uh, bring prosperity or progeny, or to make the king all powerful. But how do you know if your mantras are actually working? As in, the mantras work, but the brahmins are pronouncing it properly. By testing, you take an old animal, you sacrifice it, and then the animal gets a new body, a new life through the power of that mantra. And that then is the experiment uh, that proves the efficacy of the mantra. Uh, but these days, Mahaprabhu says, such uh, Brahmins and such pure mantra chanters don't exist. This process cannot be followed, and therefore it's one of the five things that is forbidden in this age of Kali. So they debate back and forth, and eventually uh, the Kazi agrees to Mahaprabhu's point. And Mahaprabhu requests him at the end of this dialogue, this theological dialogue, uh, he says, so I have one request, that please don't interfere with the Sankirtan anymore. <coughs> and the Kazi responds with a very famous statement. He says, I want all of my people to hear that for so long as I or my descendants rule this city, no one should interfere with the Sankirtan movement. And in fact, um, you know, in Mayapur, when they do this uh, Sankirtan, they have this, these signs with Vaishnav Tilak on them. The sign is kind of shaped like this. Mm -hmm. You see this? Like a shield. Yeah. yeah, like a shield. So this comes from the, uh, the Kazi's um, uh, seal, his coat of arms. Anyone who showed that, it was clear that they had approval from the Kazi. And so from then on, the devotees would take this out on Sankirtan to show that the party should not be disturbed, that it had the Kazi's approval on it. Now, there are many, many wonderful things that we learn from this particular story about how we ought to relate to people of other religious traditions. The first thing is that the beginning or the platform for dialogue, for interaction with someone of another religious tradition should be based not on similarity, but on difference. In other words, what I mean is, we often go into a situation like an interfaith dialogue and say, and our basic starting point is, you know, we're all the same. We all, basically all religions are the same. This seems like a very nice thing to do and to reach out like that and say, we're all the same. But this creates a very big problem. Because the fact of the matter is that for a lot of things, we're not the same. And when you say that actually we're just the same, then you're forcing that person to agree to everything that you're going to say, which he doesn't agree with at all. And you're forcing yourself to try to agree with everything he says even though you may not want to agree at all. Right? So it immediately causes suffocation. If you say, if, if, I, if I turn to Madhu Gopal Prabhu and I say, uh, you know, the two of us were just the same. Now he has to pretend like he's like me. Right? Uh, okay, so now I have to give a seminar on world religions. And I have to pretend like I'm him. He plays the piano really nicely. And now I have to all of a sudden pretend like I can play the piano, which I can't. Right? So, that causes, it, it seems like it makes things easier uh, to say we're all the same, but it actually makes things more difficult. And it causes more tension for you and for them, because you're forcing each other to agree on things that you may not want to agree on. Rather, the platform for beginning dialogue is a difference. That we look at the other person and we respect the fact that they worship God in a different way. That they are different religiously than we are. But most importantly, that their source of knowledge or pramana is different than ours. If you look at the way, for example, that the um, uh, uh, philosophers and acharyas of ancient India used to debate with each other, that all of them would speak from their own pramanas. In other words, 
you don't try to speak from the other person's scripture or from the other person's Brahman. You see what happens here uh, when Mahaprabhu says that, look, uh, you should not be killing animals. He quotes from the Vedas. How does the Kazi respond? From the quotes from the Quran. And Prabhupada has a beautiful purport there. Just not very long, very short. In fact, uh, I want to read that here. Um, he says something very nice. This is from Adi Lila, chapter 17, text number 155. Okay. Uh, Translation of Prabhupada is Divine Gesha Prabhupada. The Kazi replied, As you have your scriptures, called the Vedas and Puranas, we have our scripture, known as the Holy Quran. Purport. Chand Kazi agreed to talk with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on the strength of the scriptures. According to the Vedic scripture, if one can support his position by quoting from the Vedas, his argument is perfect. Similarly, when the Mohammedans support their position with quotations from the Quran, their arguments are also authorized. When Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu raised the question of the Mohammedans cow killing and bull killing, Jan Ghazi came to the standard of understanding from his scriptures. So, <clears throat> in other words, <clears throat> when we begin on the platform of difference, then the first thing we do is we try to meet that person on their own terms. We don't impose our terms there. We look, okay, what is your Shastra, Brahman? Who is your Guru? Who is your Sadhu? And now explain, prove your argument based on your pramanas, and let me make my point based on my pramanas. And in this way, then we can actually find some area of commonality. When you begin with difference, then people see similarities. They say, oh, in fact, yeah, in the Bible it also says this. You're quoting from Gita, but the other person will hear the Bible, because he's familiar with the Bible. And he quotes from the Bible, and you'll hear Bhagavad Gita. Oh, oh, interesting. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Oh, Krishna says in Gita, man mana man bhakto. And you'll hear something, some similarity. He'll hear the same also. But you have to begin with difference. You have to allow that person to be who they are. And this is what Mahaprabhu did. He, he asked him about, what do your scriptures say? Openly, he said, what do your scriptures say about this point that you want to do? And he accepted his Brahman. And he says, okay, this is the system that is described. But then he explained it from his side. He said, look, regulation is given in scripture, but that's still not the highest thing. You see, halal is regulating it. So means what? It's a dangerous thing. It's not something that is supposed to be done. Eventually the Kazi agreed. Sometimes people will agree, sometimes they won't. That's something we cannot control. But the method you see here very clearly. Right? The method is very nice. Begin with difference and make the foundation Brahman, or the scriptures. Uh, so, Prabhupada was very particular about this, that let's not just speak about opinions. I feel this about God, you feel that about God. No. We understand you have different scriptures. You speak from your Shastra, I speak from mine. You speak from your Guru's teachings, I speak from mine. Use some Brahman. Because without the basis of some kind of scripture, then it's all just my word against yours. And anyone can say anything. I had a dream last night, God told me this. Who's to say? But we have to be speaking from scripture. Right? <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, um, we start with difference. We meet them on their terms. And then we uh, look for scripture as uh, the basis of the discussion or the dialogue. The other thing that Srila Prabhupada mentions in the purport to these verses, he says, one thing we see clearly, that 
violence is never acceptable in a situation like this. That Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, despite the fact that at that point he had the ability, the numbers, to burn down the Qazi's house. And despite the fact that the Qazi began his relationship by violence, right? by destroying the Mridanga, physically threatening the devotees, Mahaprabhu refused to do that. He calmed down the devotees, he entered in a peaceful fashion, and he invited them out for discussion, for dialogue. Uh, this is a very important point, because violence can take many different uh, forms. It can be physical violence, it can also be trying to um, uh, hurt the other person uh, emotionally or uh, whatever it might be. Uh, but uh, you see, if we become fanatics, uh, they're behaving in a fanatical way. Why can't I be a fanatic? So we'll, what's the difference between us and them? We've all had the experience of being stopped on the street and being told that we're going to hell. We think, none of us enjoy that experience. None of us agree to it or find it pleasing. So giving that same experience to others, what's the difference then between us and them? Violence is never the solution. Aggression is never the solution in any kind of relationship like that. To the contrary, we see the specific tactics that Mahaprabhu used, the specific methods he used to speak to him. He was 100% genuine in his dialogue with the Kali. He was not doing PR, public relations, trying to look good in front of him. He was not trying to, to uh, um, flatter him. He was being 100% genuine. And he began that genuine relationship first by developing some relationship, by developing some affection, some connection. Now, what's the first thing he did? They talked about family connections, or from the village. They made small talk. You know, we're, we're part of the same town. We're part of the same community. Let's work on this together. We've got a common problem. Uh, you've got complaints from the Muslims and the Hindus. And I've got complaints from my followers. So let's talk. But we're friends. We both come from the same background in the village. And we both know each other. We find some common platform. And we begin on a point of friendship. That's one thing he does. Is he creates friendship. But the second thing, far from being violent, what he does is as soon as the Qazi comes down to speak to him, he immediately gives the Qazi a seat of honor or respect. Krishna uh, Kaviraj uh, Goswami says. He gives him a seat of honor and says, please have a seat here, let us talk. In other words, he makes a good relationship and respect as the foundation of the dialogue, of the foundation of that discussion. Before he goes into the actual topic. And when we make that the foundation, then you don't have to beat around the bush and avoid the sensitive points. You see, what happens in interfaith dialogues or connections with people of other religions, typically, uh, unfortunately, is we start off by saying, you know, all religions are the same. And then we look very hard for things that we agree on. So you believe in God, I believe in God. And, you know, we all believe that we should not murder anyone, and we should love each other. And love is the basis, God is love. And then everyone holds hands and feels good, and nothing of substance is actually said. Okay. Again and again, everyone feels good about themselves, they talk, but everyone's so nervous about actually saying anything that might in the slightest offend anyone. And so you don't know what to say. Remember yesterday we were talking about the lowest common denominator idea. You, we descend to the lowest common denominator. And that is free of any real substance or any real progress. We can't talk about anything because we're so scared. On the other hand, if we begin with a difference, create a foundation of genuine respect for the other person by saying, your scriptures are worthy as pramanas for you, 
Please take the seat of honor. You're my equal. Right? Mahaprabhu does not elevate himself. He says, no, let's sit, let's talk as equals. And we begin with respect and affection. Then when it comes to talking, you don't have to beat around the bush. He, Mahaprabhu dives straight in to the matter of most concern to him, which is, why are you feeding cows? That's what a proper foundation of respect gives. It doesn't make us weaker. And sometimes people hear this and they think, oh, you know, you're just, you're being really soft. Like, you're, this is not what a preacher does. You know? But we want, we should be preaching like a lion. Yes, but even a lion comes very softly, you know? Means you cannot, if you want to preach like a lion, then we have to know how to behave properly towards others. By giving respect, by giving affection to that person we're talking to, that does not make us weaker at all. It makes us stronger. It gives us the ability, the confidence, the trust to actually speak our mind and what we actually want to say. So we see that's what Mahaprabhu did. He shows up there first calms down any background of violence in a very peaceful fashion, sits down, gives them a seat of honor, makes a small talk, and then, um, then proceeds to ask his uh, questions to the Kazi. <coughs> Now, um, violence is never solution, and that, okay, we can all agree about. But um, the other thing uh, that is not so obvious, but is as important, is that when we're speaking to someone who's genuinely a member of another religious tradition, then conversion is never the goal. Uh, now, I mean someone who is genuinely fixed in their practice of their tradition. Uh, once again, look at Srila Prabhupada, example after example. When he meets with priests and Christians of all kinds, who he sees are clearly dedicated to their practice. What does he do? What does he tell them? He gives them the same message of Krishna consciousness when they ask. He doesn't change anything. But instead of telling them to come join the temple, he says, no, you take the names of Jesus. You'll be a better Christian, he tells them. If you're going to be a Christian, be a good Christian. Follow the instructions of Jesus Christ nicely. Again and again and again, he says this. What does it say in the Bible? Thou shalt not kill. What, what does he ask us to do? How does he ask us to behave? He doesn't try to convert. Uh, it's not only uh, mm, not good protocol, but it's also kind of wasted energy. Like, I, I'll give you an example. Suppose some dedicated Christian meets you on the street, and he says, you know, bro, you should really become a Christian. And he gives you all the quotations from the Bible and really, really works on you for an hour. What's the chances that you'll become a Christian? Zilch? Nothing? Right? Nothing at all from that conversation. How many times have you received the copy of the New Testament walking here and there? If anything, it makes you more convinced that you should be a devotee. You come back and think, wow, it's so nice to be in the temple. Why? Because your faith is already strong, right? You know the Lord in this way. Uh, and you're attached to this way of worshipping the Lord. You're convinced. And that conversation is not going to make you unconvinced. The same is true in the other direction. When someone is genuinely convinced about their religious path, then our one-hour conversation is not going to try to make, it won't make them into high officials. It won't. Now, it may still transform them, and this you see many times. You give them a copy of the Gita, they may read it, 
and feel very inspired in their own practice and really become wonderful supporters and become Krishna conscious in their own way. But not that, oh, I will be made another devotee, they're now initiated. Not like that. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of people in this world who can become devotees. The numbers of people who are actually dedicated to a practicing a particular religious path, you know, it's very small in the world now. Very small. Most of I, everyone counts themselves, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim. But those who genuinely practice, someone you talk to who's actually convinced, and who sincerely tries to follow, those are very few numbers. If they try to convert us and we try to convert them, we're just wasting time. Right? We're wasting time. You punch me, I punch you, back and forth. But we're both powerful wrestlers. It's not going to help, you see. Rather, we have to go, we think of it, okay, there's so many people out there that are seeking, that are innocent. Those are the people that um, a devotee looks for, that the Madhya Madhikai looks for and says, no, this is the person uh, who can possibly go. Everyone has to hear Krishna's name, but everyone will take it in different ways and reach different levels. Right? So full-on conversion is not the goal in any kind of dialogue. And one of the worst things that you experience is when two very religious and sincere people both sit together to talk and everyone's trying to convert each other. They're a very horrible experience. A very useless experience also. Instead, through partnership, you can get greater benefits than even conversion will get. Even better things. Again, look at this discussion with Chantasi. Did Mahaprabhu ever ask him to join in the Sankhita? No. No. He didn't. In fact, Chantasi followed Mahaprabhu home and Mahaprabhu sent him back. <laughs> means he, like a guest. He said he followed him out, you know, like you see people to the door. Mm -hmm. He followed him for some distance. He was really happy with Mahaprabhu's visit. And then Mahaprabhu said goodbye to him. He didn't try even once to say, chale, 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 let's go, let's go, to keep him in the party. No. But what did he get from that exchange? That was much more valuable than having Chantazi dance with him. Freedom. Through that partnership, he got the blessings of Kazi to perform Sankirtan anytime and anywhere for all the way to future generations with no stoppage to the Sankirtan movement. From this story, not only do we see the methods of how do we interact with people of other religions, but we see the great benefits of it. That such a great accomplishment happened that no Hindu at that time could have ever provided to Mahaprabhu's movement. Just because he was willing to engage in dialogue. If Mahaprabhu had gone with his followers and burned down his house, he would not have gotten that result. Had he decided, forget it, I'm not going to even go talk to him. Nah, I don't want to talk to Muslims. This horrible calculus. If he had thought like that, then again no benefit. Everyone would have stayed in their homes and scared doing Sankirtan. But because Mahaprabhu said, no, let me go and reach out in a mood of friendship and respect and talk to this person because I know he's a genuine follower of his religion, this is the result he got from it. Now, the results might not always be this good. Like with any relationship, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not all that good. So we can't be guaranteed of success. But one way or the other, success will happen. I... Um, uh, all over the world, especially in the United States, we don't have to worry so much because we live in a country which is very, very, um, you know, very firm on this idea that everyone should have the ability to practice their religion. And so it doesn't, if there is bigotry, it doesn't happen so openly. It happens in other ways. People use legal processes and methods to do it. But in other countries, it's just very open, you know, uh, the church is in control or something like that. And for now decades, devotees in Europe and uh, Eastern Europe particularly have used methods of dialogue as a very, very important way in which to help al um, allow the Sankirtan movement to happen and to flourish there. Um, and you see amazing results from that happening. 
just a few relationships, with just a few connections that can take place. Uh, the, the possibilities are endless uh, through those means. For, for example, for years, Anutama Prabhu has been running a Vaishnav Christian dialogue in Washington, D.C. And it's a group of Christian scholars and a group of Vaishnav scholars who come together to discuss, like this, based on their pramanas. Like they talk Christian theology on some point, and we talk about similarities and differences. And you can look, we can see, look at that and say, well, you know, people getting together, having a nice talk. Where's the practical work here? Right? But you see that when the Pope, uh, who's leading one billion Catholics around the world, decided to come to the United States, those people turned to the Hare Krishnas to greet him as a representative for all Hindus. It, I was not actually the person invited. It was Anutma Prabhu who was the contact. And then he referred me uh, there. It means they know, knew about me also from the dialogue. But Anuzma Prabhu's work in that dialogue is what caused it. Not my individual reputation, or even his individual reputation. It was the fact that this type of work was happening for 10 years. We were celebrating our 10th anniversary. That's what results in it. You can be an individual person as great as you want, and still people can ignore. But when a relationship is built, then no one can ignore that relationship. They're looking for someone to represent Hinduism. Who do we turn to? Well, for 10 years we've sat on the same table and talked to these people. Uh, is there anyone in your group who can do it? Oh, uh, of course we can. We're happy to. You see? So, the, po the, the potential that comes from a dialogue, from a partnership that's properly built, is significant, is actually amazing. But one has to be willing to hold one's horses, as they say. You have, to be, you have to be go about it in a sattvic fashion. If it's a matter of passion, where's the results? What are we doing? It doesn't happen. And like any relationship, it builds over time. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And both sides grow in their maturity. Both sides begin to appreciate the other side more in a genuine way. And then something wonderful can come from that long-term relationship that leads long to long-term fruits. This whole pastime of Jan Kazi happened with uh, Muslims who, as we spoke about last time, are Vaishnavas in the basic sense that they believe in a personal God and pray to Him. But even with those who are Mayavadis and atheists, even with them, we find Mahaprabhu using the same approach. This is actually a very good case, because it's someone who believes in God and believes in Scripture. What are people who don't believe in God, but are fixed mayavadis? Even their Mahaprabhu uses the same technique with the same success. And, well, what's the example there? You know the story? In Banaras, which is the, the main stronghold of the Mayavadis, they, Chidni uh, um, Mahapu's uh, um, devotees, Tapan Mishra and Chandrasekha Achai, when Mahapu comes to Banaras, they complain to him. They say, Lord, they're all laughing at us here. They're laughing at you. They think we're just creating a big problem. And we're just emotionless, sentimentalists. This is the same issue that the Muslims had, the same issue that the Hindus of Banaras had. It's the same issue that Hare Krishnas have always had. Okay? That we do this chanting and dancing and book distribution and so on, and uh, respectable people in society don't like to see us or to watch their kids be part of it. Um, this is very embarrassing. So they were very embarrassed. Uh, I mean, the sannyasis were. And they used to laugh at Mahaprabhu, criticize him, and, uh, and they went to Mahaprabhu and said, please, can you do something about this? We really, uh, we can't tolerate it. And so Mahaprabhu agreed, and he asked Tapar uh, Mishra Chandrasekhar to invite all of these sannyasis, headed by Prakashananda Saraswati, 
to their home for prasad. And when Mahaprabhu arrived there, he used three different techniques to capture their hearts and to convince them of his point. What were the three techniques that he used, one at a time? Does anyone remember? Sit down on a cloth. First thing he used was humility. Okay? He showed that by, as he showed up there and he sat down at the entrance on the floor, where the shoes are kept, like on either end of the temple, he just sat down right there. That's a very unclean place. And you wouldn't have anyone sit there. Especially not a respected sannyasi who's come. But he sat down there. And when they, they saw him, they said, oh, what are you doing? He said, no, 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 I don't deserve to sit in front of you. He showed extreme humility in his behavior. Second thing? Taking prasad with him? Huh? Taking prasad? Taking prasad, yes. But uh, uh, in terms of actually getting them convinced, uh, he, 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 through humility, he completely disarmed them, mm. uh, just melted them. Then, so much effulgence. Coming. Effulgence. When we meet with someone like this, we should immediately display our Brahman effulgence. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do that. Okay. But what we can do is, through our character as devotees, uh, we can through our purity and our happiness. Uh, that is very, very attractive, uh, very disarming um, uh, for someone. Uh, uh, Prabhupada, in one of his um, uh, lectures, he says how people always say how our devotees, they look so happy all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, the first, uh, first advertisements that were made in the 60s in San Francisco uh, for uh, the Kirtans, it was stay high forever. <laughs> because people thought that. In the 60s, they thought these people must be on drugs. Otherwise, how are they smiling all the time? You know, someone wakes up 4.30 in the morning and starts dancing. This is, you have to be on drugs uh, in order to be doing that. It's kind of ridiculous, if you think about it. Uh, to get up in the morning and be in front of the deities and chanting and dancing, and then we go through the whole day and not a single drop of coffee. Uh, to keep us going. <laughs> Trust. So people used to think. Uh, Prabhupada says, these devotees are always very happy. And they always look very young. Uh, have you seen those who are very uh, advanced devotees? Uh, they're always looking very young, very beautiful. Like you see sannyasis who are in their 60s, and they still look like they're in the 30s. Mm -hmm. right? Because purity, self-control, right? eating only clean things, not taking intoxicants, maintaining celibacy, these things provide youth. Right? They, they make one beautiful, and they make one effulgent, actually. And that effulgence, that happiness on the face of the devotee, is actually a very powerful, like Prabhupada says, purity is the force, right? So if purity is the force, how, how is it the force? It means people can see purity. They may not be pure themselves, but they can see purity. It says that when Narada Muni, when Rigari, you know, the hunter, he used to half kill animals. Uh, he would break their legs and then allow them to die slowly. And he would stay around to watch them die. He took so much pleasure in the suffering of others. Uh, and Narada Muni once came to where he was doing his horrific activities. Uh, and it says that when in his presence, all the suffering of the animals, it went away. They, they, they lost their pain. And all of a sudden, Rigari also felt very peaceful and very happy in his heart. He lost his desire to break their legs. And he couldn't understand what was going on. There's something wrong here. Right? means even though he wasn't anywhere close to pure at that point, and even though he was so horrible in his sinful activities and so on, and yet the purity of a devotee affected even him. Even if you're not pure yourself, we can perceive purity in us. <coughs> We may, may not be able to pinpoint it, oh, that's what it is. But we can feel it, oh, it's there. There's something there that's pure about this person. Something very attractive, we don't know what it is. And people used to see Srila Prabhupada also. There's something amazing about this person. What is it? I don't know. But they see him once, they don't forget him. Their whole life, they don't forget. Uh, there's a nice story of this um, lady that devotees met in uh, South America. And uh, she's an old lady, they knocked on her door to distribute books. 
and she looked at the picture inside and saw the picture of this Indian gentleman and said, oh my God, it's the same person. And they said, what person? This woman had been a flight attendant on a flight in South America that Prabhupada had took on one of his visits to, uh, where did he go? Uh, Caracas mm -hmm. in Venezuela. And she still remembered Shri Prabhupada. She remembered who he was, how kindly he treated her, how she tried her best to serve him, even though, you know, we don't take much on the plane, but Jews and this and that. And she never forgot him. That affected her in a deep way. So that when a devotee came with the book, she recognized Prabhupada. So happy to see him and took the book. Right? So the point is that a devotee's purity, we may not be that pure, but we have some purity. We should have some purity by following the four regulated principles, by chanting Krishna's holy name regularly, by associating with devotees. If something rubs off on us, we should be able to give that just by our presence to others. That was the second technique that Mahaprabhu used. And the third? You say, uh, if I'm fool, like when Prakashananda Saraswati asked, why do you chant, chant and dance on the streets? Why don't you study Vedic scriptures with us? And then he said that I was considered my teacher, yes. my guru, that I am fool. And, uh, and when I chant and dance, so much tears comes. Uh, yes. So he, his humility stretched all the way through the discussion. It's true. Not just in the beginning when he sat on the edges, on the, on the doorway, but all throughout he presented himself in a very humble manner. Actually, the same thing is true in his di uh, discussions with Sava Bhavan Bhattacharya also. Uh, a lot of humility he displayed there. So, humility is there, and his uh, brilliance and effulgence is there. But there's also a third technique that he uses that's different from the other two. He gave a nice answer to the question there. Yes. yes. He, through his uh, knowledge, right? through his uh, erudition, his, his ability to discuss nicely. In other words, that our study of scripture, our knowledge and so on, they are of course important also. You cannot just use these techniques and manage. It means one has to also have, have like we were saying, Brahmana, one has to have knowledge of scripture and Shastra, and that has to be the basis. So he wasn't a fool. He called himself a fool, and he felt himself a fool, but he wasn't actually a fool. The Prabhupada says, devotees should not be fools. You have to be, I've given you all these books so that you can study, not just to sell. So, that knowledge Chaitanya Mahaprabhu displayed. And when he was asked by Prakashananda Sarasati, tell us what you think, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, again, he didn't beat around the bush. You see the pattern here? He, he didn't then be nice at and say, actually, well, you know, we all are one and we agree and, you know, it's, it's a common platform and you believe in reincarnation, I believe in reincarnation. No, then he got straight to the point. Right? He was very clear. He says, my dear sir, the meaning of Vedanta Sutra is completely obvious to me. It's unfortunately your explanation that makes it all confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he did this with Sahaja Mahatma 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 Chai spent seven days talking to Mahaprabhu, uh, giving all his explanations. And Mahaprabhu didn't say a word. And finally, Sahaja Mahatma Chai stopped and said, you have any questions? This is difficult stuff. Is it clear? Is it all going through over your head? And Mahaprabhu said, well... The Vedanta Sutra is crystal clear, but your explanations make no sense. Right? <laughs> now that you asked, I have something to say. So then the Lord doesn't, you know, beat around the bush and say, you know, this and that. He gets straight to the point. This is this is this is how it is. Right? This is how I see it. This is how we understand it. This is what Shasta says. Uh, but that groundwork is there of humility. Humility builds that relationship. It's the most important actually feature in building a relationship with someone you don't know. If you meet someone, you don't know them. So family, we have other bases for relationships. Uh, because this is my son, this is my father, we've got a blood relationship. Uh, or we might have a relationship through marriage because it's my husband, my wife. But if you meet someone on the street, you never know. How do you build a relationship with someone cold for the first time? The easiest way to do that is through humility. No person then can deny you a relationship if you come in humility. You come and you say, 
Actually, you're a very, very wise person. You know, I really heard you're very successful in this. You're, you're an expert, isn't it? Can you give me some advice? They often say, if you're looking for money, then ask for advice. And if you're looking for advice, ask for money. Do <laughs> <laughs> you use that technique for new technology? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they don't give it away. So, the, the idea is that you come with humility. And, you know, I'm not saying superficial. It's kind of a joke, okay? But superficial humility, people can see very easily. If you're trying to flatter someone, or, you know, people can see through. Yeah, this guy's flattering. How often do you see this in India? You, you go and you, you know, you be like, eh, it's like, okay, everyone's doing this, you're doing it also. You want something from me, it's kind of obvious. No, not like that. A devotee is genuine. We go with humility and we say, okay, this person may not be everything I want to be myself, but they've got some good quality that Krishna has given them. Right? This person is super intelligent. This person is super successful. This person is super rich. And like we were saying uh, earlier, yesterday, yad yad vibhuti matsatvam that some vibhuti he has, this is tejoanshasambhava, this is Krishna's energy here, that somehow he has received because of his good karma. So, okay, I can go genuinely and say, Sir, you are so successful. Uh, this is how, you remember how Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur used to go door to door? What do they do? They say, Sir, you are such a respectable person. You are so successful. Please, once, can you chant the name of Krishna? And this is how they would win people's hearts. Now, some people, they even then, they won't, like Jagan and Malai. That is the risk we take. But in general, the easiest and most genuine way to build a new relationship with someone you don't know and with whom you may not share too much in common, is to approach in humility. And we see that Mahaprabhu doing that with Prakashananda the Saraswati, with Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, with Chandakasi. So, these are the various um, uh, techniques or methods that we see uh, through Mahaprabhu's Leela of how he gave us a wonderful example of how we can understand and relate with uh, any type of person from any religious background. We are very fortunate to have Mahaprabhu's incarnation, avatar, in this age of Kali. Uh, because Mahaprabhu came just 500 years ago. And you know, 500 years ago, um, is very recent. The situation in the world is different, but not that much different. All the religions that we have today were there during Mahaprabhu's time. In fact, India had already seen the first contact with Christians also in the 16th century, like when Mahaprabhu was still on the planet. The Portuguese had already started showing up in India at that time. And the Muslims had already been ruling for centuries. Right? So, we can actually relate a lot, we can learn a lot from reading Chaitanya Charitamrita. Because the interactions and the methods that Mahaprabhu shows in Chaitanya Charitamrita, they are so much closer to our own time and context, context than, say, Krishna killing Putana. Right? Uh, and so the Lord is very kind that He comes in a time period that is our own. So we can very easily relate to him. And not only does he come in our time period, but he comes as a devotee, so we can 90% of the time do what he's doing. Sometimes, 10% of the time, he'll show himself as God, and then we cannot imitate him. But most of the time, he's behaving as a devotee. In a context that is similar to ours. I mean, 500 years is nothing. Uh, you know, in India, people keep records of who their grandfathers and great-grandfathers are for a couple hundred years, easy. Uh, we hear stories in our own families going back a few hundred years. It's not much, 500 years, especially in a place like India, which maintains memories for centuries, thousands of years. 500 is nothing. It means Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came just yesterday, practically speaking. 
in the time scale of things. The Lord Himself, Krishna Himself. That's how fortunate we are. And <clears throat> if you read Chaitanya Chaitanya carefully, you will find every type of situation in terms of devotee interactions and devotee behavior present there in the pages of Chaitanya Chaitanya. Devotee community. Uh, in the community of devotees, you will have some people who get along very easily with others, others who don't get along so easily, some who are very, very determined and always bucking the trend and doing something that's a little bit edgy, and others who are very, very, yes, I'll do whatever you ask. All of those types of devotees and their personalities, you find it in Chaitanya Chaitanya. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu dealing with them in such an expert way. People from different parts of India, different villages, how he deals with the Pathans and how he deals with the, the Bengalis and with the Oriens and people from South India. Right? How he debates with South Indian Brahmins like uh, Venkat Bhatta and how he discusses with North Indian Mayavadis like Prakashan and the Saraswati. You see how he deals with villagers when he goes to Braj and other places. How he deals with very kings and polished city folks like uh, Maharaj Pratapa Rudra. How he maintains his vows of sannyas. How he behaves as a grihastha. What he does if a devotee is causing some problems in the community, even though he's genuinely being a nice devotee, but still somehow there's not a personality man. You see how Mahaprabhu deals with that in Bhagavata, uh, in Chaitanya Chaitanya. It's a very, um, especially because God Purnima is coming up, I, I, I really want to encourage all of us to, to study Chaitanya Chaitanya. Um, even if you haven't completed Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, all together. Still, you can read Chaitanya Chaitanya alongside. It's actually very nice reading to do in the evenings. Um, my grandmother, uh, when she was 75, 80 years old, um, uh, she read entire Chaitanya Chaitanya. Every evening, she would just sit down. She doesn't even know English very well, but she wanted to read it in English, because Prabhupada wrote it like that. And she would read, and every day, every evening, before she went to bed, she would just read three, four pages. That's all. It took her two, three years, but she finished entirely in Chaitanya. And my grandfather, he did the same before he passed away. And he left behind. It was very amazing, after he passed away. Before he passed away, he told my uh, Chachi, my uh, father's younger brother's um, wife, uh, that uh, uh, he said, I'm leaving you a great khajana, a great treasure. And he said, uh, please look at it when I'm gone. It's in the, and he told her, it's in the upper shelf of this in this room, and you can use the keys there. And after he passed away, as he had asked, she took the key and opened the door. And inside, if she found all his notes on the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he had taken. And he was completely transformed by reading Mahaprabhu's life. He was not a man to be easily convinced. For his whole life, we were trying to convince him right, about Krishna consciousness. And he's very, he'd argue and very skeptical, and so on and so forth. But we didn't know. On the side, without telling anyone, he was reading Mahaprabhu's life. <laughs> and by the end of his life, he was completely transformed. And he left all these detailed notes about Mahaprabhu did this in Banaras, he did this like that, and I got this realization. And he said, this, I left your great Pajan. No money, no nothing. There's all these notes on his reading of Mahaprabhu's life. So, it's something um, we're very lucky that Krishna has chosen to come. Only one in a thousand Kali Yugas, the Lord comes as Mahaprabhu. And we are very fortunate that He's come in our Kali Yuga. And we have been born just 500 years after His departure. So fortunate that we should not miss out on this opportunity to read uh, uh, Chaitanya Chaitanya. Otherwise, we're, you know, we're, we're wasting our kajana, actually. Uh, we've been given a great treasure, and we're just throwing it away. Um, every, every psychological situation, every devotee uh, um, relationship question, every preaching technique, we can find an example of it in Chaitanya Chaitanya. In a very practical way. Uh, very practical. Um, so, I'm going to pause there and see if anyone has...
uh, any questions or comments about what I said so far in terms of the uh, method of approach, the technique that we discussed uh, from the Leela Chankazi and Prakashan and Saraswati. Uh, any questions uh, about uh, that material before we move on? Yes, please. Well, when we ask younger generations, they say nowadays that maybe in your age, your time, the scale 50 years or 10, 20 years ago, now world is different and we act differently. So it's very difficult to relate to your own children because they immediately, nobody does like this. Uh, we are in a different time scale. It may be in your time, so we don't want to follow. Yes. So that is very common problem. Yes. And how to deal with that. Yes. I, it, yeah, like you said, everyone thinks that my time is unique and my time is different mm -hmm. than the previous. You know, even we say, oh, but Arjun had Krishna in front of him. I don't have Krishna, so I cannot behave like that. Or oh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was there, the things were different than what it is. Or you're a pure devotee, or Prabhupada was, it was different when he was here. But now our times are different. So also children say, well, your times are different, mine are different. Yeah. So that's, that's very uh, natural. But over time, especially with children, over time, as we grow up, then we come to realize, oh, I turned into a photocopy of my parents. What happens? <laughs> it, it, it happens at some point where you spend a good number of your years trying to prove how different you are from your parents. And then at some point, you look at yourself and go, did I just say that? <laughs> did I just behave like that? I never liked that about my parents and yet I've become them. <laughs> uh, and so this is, uh, often it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. It means there are different ways in which we can try to convince and so on. But Mark Twain, he says, says something very interesting that after, uh, I forget who the name of the character was, was it? Anyway, he, in one of his writings, this, this, this boy, he goes and he, he has this tense relationship with his father and he can't really connect with him. He says, this old man, he knows nothing. Then he goes around, he travels the world for a couple of years. When he comes back, he's shocked at how much his father has learned in the last two, three years. <laughs> Which means what? What is Mark Twain saying? That the boy himself changed. When he went through those travels, those experiences, all of a sudden he comes back and he realized, hey, my parents were not that foolish to begin with. <laughs> I just thought it like that. He thought, oh, my dad has learned a lot. But he had changed as a result of that experience. So time is the greatest teacher in this world. Uh, this is um, uh, Vishnu Dev, he describes this. Time is the greatest teacher in this world. And the Lord teaches us through time, through our experiences. <clears throat> and so uh, we try our best in terms of trying to explain and, and so on. But then time itself, sometimes one may learn from one's peers, sometimes from someone else. Right? Sometimes parents seem too outdated, but we hear from another devotee and we feel convinced, right? Sometimes we have to experience ourselves and we forget, as parents we might forget that I wasn't so convinced to begin with. I had to experience so much in my life before I was convinced. So maybe they need to experience also and go about their aspirations and desires and so on. So it can be a number of different things that, that happen. But in the course of time, then we do our best and in the course of time then Krishna in his form as Tala, in his form as time, he takes care of the rest. He, uh, we all learn and, and grow as a result. So, yes, Prabhu. So, when uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to Gaya, mm -hmm. and as you said, uh, there's complete transform, I still have a question, what happened to him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened to him? Yeah. Well, there he met Ishwara Puri. Right. Yeah? And Ishwara Puri initiated him into the chanting of the holy names. And as a result of that, then Mahaprabhu began to display the uh, great ecstasies of love of God, which was the whole purpose, the internal reason for his appearance, was to taste that ecstasy of love for Krishna. Right? And he began to then um, feel those ecstasies, uh, um, receiving initiation from Ishwara Puri. So, um, that story you know, yes? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, in other words, that uh, we see that the Lord uh, is showing the importance of going to a spiritual master, right? But, of course, the Lord is not dependent on the spiritual master. And so, he's looking for a reason, for an excuse to now begin the real purpose 
of his visit, because uh, of his avatar, his descent to this earth. Because up to this point, you know, all the other Shivas Thakur, Advaita Acharya, were, were shaking their heads and going, my Lord, when are you going to stop this farce? You know, you're pretending to be this big scholar and debate and this, this, this you know, what, please, show us your true colors now. The world is waiting. And so Mahaprabhu used this trip to Gaya as the, as the catalyst, as the mechanism to, to show his true colors, uh, to, to taste Krishna Prema and to give to others. Thank you. Yes. Um, Prabhuji, um, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, lecture again. So, uh, one question I had was when you were saying about interfaith dialogue, uh, the first thing that you said was we begin with difference, hmm. instead of saying we're all, and then meeting on other terms, uh, fine, but, but then in Changa's pastime, we are saying that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he actually, in your, in your own words, he says, um, finds some common terms. Hmm. Right? When we, it is our natural tendency that when we yes. begin a conversation, um, not into the infiltration of the topic, but we try to find some common yes, terms. Yes. So, when we're, it sounds contradictory. Yes. No, this is exactly the point. I'm glad you brought it up. That when we begin with difference, we will yes. then see similarity. Right? We will end up with genuine similarity. If you begin with similarity, then all you end up seeing is difference. Right? Because you force the other person and you said, you're just like me. And that person in their mind is thinking, oh really? Like, do you really accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? No, you don't. And, and the Hindu will say, yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Uh, Jesus is avatar also. He said, no, he's not avatar, he's Jesus. And he's the Supreme Lord. And your gods are not avatars. You know, so he's thinking, how are you different? And you're thinking, how is he different? Uh, at some point I have to bring up BTG in this discussion. Okay? Even though we're the same. Okay? <laughs> So, you begin with similarity and everyone's looking for difference. You begin with difference, then there can be a deeper similarity that you can find right, from that. You allow that to manifest rather than forcing it. And it works. Nine times out of ten it works. As you predicted, meat eating is my next question. Yeah, okay. So, um, whenever we talk about meat eating in, um, in Sanat and Dharma or Vedic scriptures, um, I have seen some people arguing, um, quoting uh, Yadha in Mahabharat, Vyadha uh, and Kaushika conversation leading to you know, meat eating, defending meat eating in Sanatana. Do uh -huh. you have any comments? Uh, what is the Vyadha and Kaushika conversation? Uh, Dharma Vyadha is, uh, is this, um, um, he's, he's a meat shop, he's, a, he's been, his tradition from his forefathers is to be um, um, animal killer and supplying meat uh, to the village. Uh -huh. And then comes Kaushika, uh, who is a Brahmana, who challenges him that, how are you doing this? This is the principle, Daya is being slaughtered right here. Mm -hmm. And so, then they, they, start con uh, they start the conversation. And it, it was re really peculiar that I did not see this in uh, Krishna Dharma Prabhupada's Mahabharata, mm -hmm. uh, but it is in uh, other Mahabharats, and it's, uh, which are true translations from Sanskrit. So, mm -hmm. So, if you have any comments, so we are because we. Are so, what's the but what's the conclusion of their discussion? The conclusion is, uh, um, it seems to be the conclusion is that uh, if if it is if it is coming from family tradition, what's what's wrong? Uh -huh. What's the what's the point that um, the other brings to Kaushika? Right, and Kaushika agrees. Yes, it's it's like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. In in the in Mahabharat and in the Vedas in general. We find two contexts where animal killing uh, is um, sanctioned in a controlled way. Right? Uh, two or maybe three contexts. One is in terms of Vedic sacrifices, done by Brahmanas, which I've already explained. Uh, the second is in terms of Kshatriyas, who are uh, eating a a meat in order to make themselves uh, powerful for fighting in battle. Um, now, in Ramayana, it is very, in Valmiki Ramayana, it is very interestingly stated that although Kshatriyas were in the habit of doing this, Lord Ramachandra, when this would be customarily or socially required, after the, it says particularly after the sacrifice that he did at the end, the Rajasuya, uh, Valmiki Muni makes a specific point that Lord Ramachandra only smelled the meat and then put it aside. 
In other words, he did not taste it, he did not eat it, he did not consume it. Because for a devotee, for a Vaishnava, it is not acceptable. And the third context in which it's described is in the context of uh, religious practices in the mode of ignorance, such as worshipping certain forms of Devi and certain forms of Lord Shiva, in which the animal is sacrificed using various kinds of mantras and rituals on the night of the full moon, etc., etc., and offered to Kalima or offered to others uh, as a, a sacrifice of blood. And this is something that is, uh, as I was explaining yesterday, is done uh, particularly to help those people who insist on eating meat. Prabhupada says there are some people who will always insist on eating meat. Uh, and in this way, regulating it so that it stays to be something that is controlled and something that they will eventually think about what they are doing. If you have to kill with your own hands. means I can say that 90% of the people who eat meat today would not have the courage to take an animal and slice its neck on their own. Right? And the point that the Shastas are trying to make is if you want to eat that meat, then you have to do it properly. Right? So that you understand that here's someone that is screaming and bleeding, just like you would scream and bleed. This, this is, I, life is flowing out of this body. And you are taking that life away, so that you have to be, do with your eyes open. Not this hermetically sealed and packaged and sterilized, mm -hmm. this and that, lumps of flesh that you get. You don't have to think about where it comes from. So these are the three contexts in which the Vedas uh, talk about meat eating. Now, in relation to your specific question, the, there's, there's a difficulty with the Mahabharata, and I'll tell you what it is. Um, Madhvacharya, uh, he describes in his uh, Bharata Tatpari Nirnaya, he says that a lot of the Mahabharata is corrupted, mm -hmm. is lost, is changed, is decayed, is fragmented, it's been, things have been added into it, subtracted. And the easiest way to see this is if you read Mahabharata um, versions from North India, very different than Mahabharata versions from South India. Uh, very different from Mahabharata versions from Eastern India. Right? Things have been changed over time, and things have been adapted, and therefore you find some things in Mahabharata which are not actually acceptable to its devotees, because, and they're not even reliable. The best way to see whether it's reliable or not is to uh, judge it based on Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? So in, Shima, in Mahabharata, for example, Queen Kunti is part of this plot to kill five innocent men, uh, boys, and their father, uh, in the, and their mother, rather, in the Lakshagraha, uh, so that they can escape and people will think that they have died. Now, from Bhagavatam, we find out that Queen Kunti is actually a very, very great Vaishnavi, right? and a great devotee of the Lord. And her character there often does not match with her character in Mahabharata. And therefore, we have to take Srimad Bhagavatam as the golden standard in that regard. Because even speaking from an academic perspective, even if we forget the spiritual side, the, Mahabharata, uh, the Bhagavatam has not changed at all since ancient times. Right? It's, it, the, the, the manuscripts of the Bhagavatam, the versions of the Bhagavatam are identical, they're the same, they're, they're reliable, and so many Acharyas for the last 800 years or more have written commentaries on Bhagavatam using exactly the same text. The Mahabharata is not like you have different versions of Mahabharata all around India. And, you know, you, it's difficult to say which one is right, which one is correct. Even Madhvacharya is saying this. So that's why Mahabharata is very useful because it's an engaging story that teaches us a lot about dharma and how people behave and so on. But the most important reason it's useful is because of Bhagavad Gita. Right? That is the real fruit of Mahabharata that devotees are looking for. Mm -hmm. And although all the Mahabharata has changed, the 18 chapters of Bhagavad Gita are identical all throughout history. It's fact. It has not, not changed at all. Uh, so that is reliable. Srimad Bhagavatam is reliable. Mahaprabhu, Krishna himself, looked at red Bhagavatam in the same form we have today. We know that because his own immediate disciples wrote commentaries on it. And he approved it as this is Amala Purana, spotless Purana. Right? So read Bhagavatam and then judge Mahabharata and other Puranas and scriptures based on the standard of Srimad Bhagavatam. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, other questions, uh, comments? Yes. And just on the conversation with Chan Kazi and, and Jitin Makabu, at some point the conversation evolves into this, this conclusion that even Chan Kazi says, you know, Qur'an is kind of lame. You know? yeah. <laughs> he actually says that, you know, your scriptures are pretty good, I was kind of new, I don't think they're reliable. He actually kind of admits that, maybe you want to elaborate Yes. That. In the end, he does admit. He says that actually there are two different paths described in the Qur'an, Pravitti Mag and Navritti Mag. He uses it in, in Hindu terms. But he says one is the path of enjoyment, the other is the path of detachment. And the path of detachment is superior than the path of enjoyment, even though we talk mostly about the path of enjoyment. The path of enjoyment permits the eating of meat, but the path of uh, detachment does not. And in fact, these scriptures are not the highest. There's actually some real problems associated with them, so you're actually right. But I can't say this publicly because I'm Chan Kazi. <laughs> so this type of reaction is, of course, wonderful, but uh, it's not something we, we can reasonably expect. Uh, like I said, in most cases, that's not going to happen. Uh, sometimes it may, uh, but in most cases it won't. Uh, but yes, it, it, uh, he has a very brilliant response in the end. Uh, other questions? Yes, go. So, I think Chan Kazi, he was concept in the first couple of years. Is he? He's considered like... Kansa. Yeah, because okay, he's yes. in Lamba Tilden, Mama connection with uh -huh. Mama. Okay. <coughs> I've heard that before, although... Um, yeah, okay. So, so, I was asking, if, is there like... Is he like... A, is it the Bhakta devotee just playing a role in this kind of... Um, I, I don't know. My guess is not. Uh, because, you know, the, the demons, they come often to, to relate to Krishna, um, but uh, a Nitya Siddha devotee very rarely comes as a demon. It means sometimes, like as a result of a curse, Jayam Vijayam came as Shushupal Dantavakra But in general, they're serving the Lord in positive ways, because there's enough demons out there in the world. Krishna <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but in Mahaprabhu Gita, you find that the demons are often, that is their last life, like they are liberated at that point. So, Jagai Madhai or Jai Vijay, and they return back to God, and this is the, the, the end. Uh, so, it's possible, I mean, certainly he doesn't display all the venom that Kamsa displayed. He's very, actually a very wonderful figure, like uh, Mother Mubhaku was saying at the end, he he's becomes a, a wonderful supporter and, and devotee in his own way. You know, he doesn't give up the practice of Islam. But he becomes, a, in his own way, a devotee. And so, maybe this is, this is, this is the point at which Kansa becomes liberated, becomes with this in that, you know? So, um, actually, Chal Kazi Samadhi is there in Mayapur, if you visited there. And not just Muslims, but also Hindus go and pay their respects. And all the Vaishnavas, they go and they worship him there as a great devotee. Uh, so, yeah, very special. In the back, yes. We did elaborate about the discussion between Saru, Bhattacharya, and, and Mahabharu Ji. Because, you see, I mean, as you mentioned, it's only five, nine years ago. The place where he spoke to Saru, Bhattacharya, you can even see it now. That is where he gave the six arm form, the Sashtra Bhattacharya. And also, what we descend from there is the Gambhira. That's Mahabharu Ma spent years in, in isolation with his disciples. So these, these are, I mean, these are not historical because you can give it back. Go now and see where he lived for all these years. Yeah. But will you please elaborate about the discussion? And I think there is a particular verse that he explained to Saro Muraji in nine different ways. Oh, more than that? Oh, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 64. 64. 64. Yeah. So, um, I don't know all those 64 explanations. But uh, the Leela is wonderful. It's very, very nice. Um, I'll just tell it in brief. Um, but uh, Vas Sarvam Bhattacharya, his full name was Vasudev Sarvam And he was a great scholar. So much so, not just by our Chaitanya Chaitanya but even today, scholars will study the works he has written. He wrote on Navya Nyaya before he became a Vaishnava. That's how well known he is. A scholar of Nyaya, he was, of logic, and of Vedanta, Vasudev Sarvabhoma. And he was uh, really, um, uh, he was the, the main, um, what's the word, philosopher. scholar, philosopher in the court of Maharaj Pratapuru. Mm -hmm. So, very major personality. And when he saw Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he felt affection on him like a father would feel. 
And he said, you know, you're a sannyasi of the Bharati order. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sannyas guru was Kesha Bharati. Now, in, the, in, in Shankara's Chaya Sanyas system, there are ten categories of sannyasi, Dashanami sannyasi, Bharati and Puri and Girtha and all these. And uh, he said, I want to give you instruction on Vedanta uh, so that you can become a higher order, like Saraswati. This is a Prakash on the Saraswati, it's a very high order of sannyas. This is another reason why Mahaprabhu was making himself humble. Right? Only Bharati. Your, your, uh, uh, so, uh, he, he, uh, Mahaprabhu, he said, okay, uh, I, uh, you know, here's someone very affectionately wanting to give me instruction. So he sat down to listen from him. And for seven days, he listened very quietly from uh, Sarvamu Bhattacharya. Uh, he didn't say a word. Now, this is also something very significant. Because it shows us the amount of patience we often have to have if we want to build relationships with those who are in positions of great success, power, status, intelligence in this world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come easily. Uh, sometimes we even have to listen to stuff we don't want to listen to. <laughs> seven days he spent. We might spend seven years in college uh, listening to all kinds of stuff we don't want to listen to. <laughs> And then after seven years, I, you get your PhD, and then they say, Oh, do you have something to say? <laughs> um, actually, yeah, I have a few things to say. Okay. Uh, means he earned his respect, Sabagong Bhattacharya's respect. And after those seven days, he said, uh, you, Do you have something to say? Do you have any questions? Have you understood? And then Mahaprabhu started telling him. Uh, he <coughs> talked about uh, Shankaracharya's commentary on Vedanta Sutra. And what are the problems associated with that commentary? He talks about the Atma Rama verse. Atma Rama Shimuniyu Nidranta Pirukrame Kurvanti Haitukim Bhaktim Itam Bhuta Guno Hari. And the, the basic meaning of that verse is that so wonderful are the qualities of the Lord. Itam Bhuta Guno Hari. Right? The qualities of the Lord, Guno Hari, Itam Bhuta, are so wonderful that even those who are Atma Rama, they are completely self-satisfied, as in they are liberated. And they are munis, great sages. Nirgrantha, they have no attachments towards anything. So you cannot attract them by beautiful song, by good food, by women, by music, by any kind of attraction in this world. Those types of people, Purvanti Ahaitukim Bhakti, they still come and try to love Krishna in an unmotivated, selfless way. So wonderful are the qualities of the Lord. Krishna is so wonderful that they still do this. And this proves that Krishna's nature and qualities are not material. Because these people have given up all material connections, and yet they still love Krishna, means Krishna's form and qualities and attributes are not material like Shankaracharya says they are. And this was how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was arguing against uh, this Mayavad philosophy that he had listened to. And Sava Gombatachai is completely transformed after this experience. And so much so, uh, Kavikarnapura in his Chaitanya Chandrogaya play that he wrote, uh, he describes how one morning uh, um, he came to see, uh, sorry, one morning Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, got up very early and took some Jagannath Mahaprasad before uh, Brahmamurta, just at the time, and he knocked on Sava Gombatachai's door. And Sava Gombatachai, opened the door, he was still, you know, came out straight from bed and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave him this Mahaprasad. And he said, oh, Mahaprabhu, I, I haven't eaten, I haven't, you know, brushed my teeth. And Mahaprabhu said, no, this is Mahaprasad. You can have it just like this. Eat it now. <laughs> and so Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya took it and he started dancing in ecstasy. This is very, very, completely transformed. Uh, this is another thing you learned from this story, actually. That no matter how learned and brilliant and elevated and status and, and rich and smart a person is that you're trying to introduce to Krishna consciousness, nothing works as effectively as Krishna Prasad. <laughs> I have seen this at Oxford again and again and again. It means we have the best scholars in the, the city show up for the, uh, seeing the center that we have there and so on. And 
Everyone would come and they'd talk and discuss, but everyone would be waiting, 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 waiting <laughs> until the food was laid out. Right? And all these big, big scholars would become like little kids around that table. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll take seconds. Yeah, I thought, okay, I'll take some more. Yeah. Completely. Uh, and in fact, after some time after that, uh, it's this really sweet incident in, in Jitin Chaitanya. All the devotees are, are uh, swimming. Uh, uh, having a good time in uh, the lake, um, what's it called? Uh, Bindusarova? Uh, and they're splashing about. And Nityananda uh, Prabhu uh, and Advaita Acharya, they've always got tension going. And so they're, they're splashing each other, really having a water fight, basically. And Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya and, um, oh, who's his pair? Haidas Thakur, I think. They're having a water fight. And they're giggling and laughing. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is standing on the shore with Gopinath Patanayaka, who is the brother-in-law of Sarva And he turns to him, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu turns to him and says, Gopinath, what has happened to this Sarva This grave, proud scholar, who is court Acharya, still is, of Maharaj Pratap Mahindra. And here he's having a water fight and laughing and joking with Haidas uh, Thakur, you know, and Haidas Thakur is Muslim, right? So, pure Brahman, Muslim, you know, this is, this is com what's wrong? And um, uh, uh, he, uh, Gopinath says a wonderful uh, verse, he says, My dear Lord, he says, Shushka Tarka Khali Khaite, Janma Gela Ja, Tomar katha mitta piyao e kripa tomar. He says, Shushka tarka khali khai te, janma gela ja. That this Sarvabhoma had spent his whole life, janma gela ja, doing what? Shushka tarka khali khai te, eating the dry husk cakes of uh, logic. Shushka tarka, of mental speculation, of, of this dry knowledge. Kali, made from this uh, husks, you know, like uh, it has no substance, just a lot of fiber. He spent his whole life eating this. Now, Tomar Kathamrita Priya, Eitripa Tomar. Now, he is drinking the nectar of your, of your Katha, of your Krishna Katha. This is your great person. Someone who spent their whole life eating food without salt and without ghee, and without sugar, and no butter, and no milk, and no grains, just the husks. That person, you give them nectar to drink. Of course he will react like this. <laughs> he will behave like this. He becomes just like a child, jumping and dancing. And in fact, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu goes to Banaras, and he meets um, Prakashananda Saraswati, the only thing Prakashananda Saraswati cannot figure out in his argument. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's clearly a sentimentalist and he's jumping up and down, he's gone crazy and all his followers are crazy. But what he can't figure out is he's heard of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. <laughs> and he's wondering, uh, how is it that Sarvabhoma became his follower? And you know what he decides? That Chaitanya Mahaprabhu must be a magician. He put some spell on Sarvabhoma <laughs> to make him that crazy. That someone such a great scholar, whose reputation was all over India, that person became mad like Mahaprabhu did. So this is the effect of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, lila, of his pastimes. Uh, and in fact, it leads us very, very nicely into uh, the final section of the seminar, which will be the Sunday Feast Lecture, which is, uh, what is it about um, Mahaprabhu? philosophy that makes it unique and that makes it different from all others. Yeah, I, I, we said here that we have to begin from the point of difference. And if we begin from the point of difference and we have a common platform of affectionate relationships <coughs> with respect and humility, then we said that there should be no worry, no fear, no anxiety about saying things as they are. 
by uh, expressing our own position very, very clearly and being proud of it. And so, if that is the case, then what is it that makes us unique? What is it that we can say with pride, with our head held high, that this is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is unique in the history of the world. This is the gift that he has given me and all of us. This is what is different about us, what is special. What is that that we can say? Uh, and that will be the topic of the Sunday's class. Okay. Thank you all very much for your attention.